Chapter 1 of History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christopher Smith. Book 5, Chapter 1. The Discussion of Leipzig, 1519 luther's dangers god saves luther the pope sends a chamberlain the legate's journey briefs of rome circumstances favourable to the reformation miltitz with spalatin tetzel's terror caresses of miltitz a recantation demanded luther refuses but offers to be silent agreement between luther and the nuncio the legate's embrace Tetzel overwhelmed by the legate, Luther to the Pope, nature of the Reformation, Luther against separation, De Vio and Miltitz at Treves, Luther's cause extends in different countries, Luther's writings on the commencement of the Reformation. Dangers had gathered round Luther and the Reformation. The doctor of Wittenberg's appeal to a general council was a new attack on papal authority. By a bull of Pius II, the greater excommunication had been denounced even against emperors who should dare to incur the guilt of such a revolt. Frederick of Saxony, as yet imperfectly confirmed in evangelical doctrine, was prepared to send Luther away from his states and hence a new message from leo might have thrown the reformer among strangers who would be afraid to compromise themselves by receiving a monk whom rome had anathematized and even should the sword of some noble be drawn in his defence mere knights unable to cope with the powerful princes of germany must soon have succumbed in the perilous enterprise but at the moment when all the courtiers of leo x were urging him to rigorous measures and when one blow more might have placed his adversary in his hands the pope suddenly changed his course to one of conciliation and apparent mildness it may be said no doubt that he was under a delusion as to the elector's feelings and deemed them more decided in luther's favour than they really were it may also be admitted that the public voice and the spirit of the age powers which at this time were altogether new seem to throw an impregnable barrier around the reformer it may even be supposed with one of leo's biographers that he followed the promptings of his mind and heart which inclined to gentleness and moderation still this new mode of action on the part of rome at such a moment is so extraordinary that it is impossible not to recognize in it a higher and mightier hand there was then at the court of rome a saxon noble who was chamberlain to the pope and canon of mentz treves and meissen he had turned his talents to advantage as he boasted of being in some degree allied to the saxon princes the roman courtiers sometimes designated him by the title of duke of saxony in italy he made an absurd display of his german nobility while in germany he aped the manners and polish of the italians he was given to wine a vice which his residence at the court of rome had increased still the roman courtiers hoped great things from him his german extraction his insinuating address and his ability in negotiation all led them to expect that charles de miltitz this was his name would by his prudence succeed in arresting the mighty revolution which was threatening to shake the world it was of importance to conceal the true object of the chamberlain's mission and in this there was no difficulty four years before the pious elector had applied to the pope for the golden rose this rose the fairest of flowers was emblematic of the body of jesus christ and being annually consecrated by the sovereign pontiff was presented to one of the first princes in europe on this occasion it was resolved to send it to the elector miltitz set out with a commission to examine into the state of affairs and to gain over the elector's counsellors spalatin and pfeffinger for whom he had special letters 
rome hoped that by securing the favour of the persons about the prince she would soon become the mistress of her formidable adversary the new legate who arrived in germany in december fifteen hundred and eighteen was careful as he came along to ascertain the state of public opinion to his great astonishment he observed at every place where he stopped that the majority of the inhabitants were friendly to the reformation and spoke of luther with enthusiasm for one person favourable to the pope there were three favourable to the reformer luther has preserved an anecdote of the journey what think you of the sea or seat of rome frequently asked the legate at the mistresses of the inns and their maidservants one day one of these poor women with great simplicity replied how can we know what kind of seats you have at rome and whether they are of wood or stone the mere rumour of the new legate's arrival filled the elector's court the university the town of wittemberg and all saxony with suspicion and distrust thank god wrote melancthon in alarm martin still breathes it was confidently stated that the roman chamberlain had received orders to possess himself of luther's person by force or fraud and the doctor was advised on all hand to be on his guard against the stratagems of miltitz his object in coming said they is to seize you and give you up to the pope persons worthy of credit have seen the briefs of which he is the bearer i await the will of god replied luther in fact miltitz brought letters addressed to the elector and his counsellors to the bishops and to the burgomaster of wittemberg he was also provided with seventy apostolic briefs should the flattery and the favours of rome attain their object and frederick deliver luther into her hands these seventy briefs were to serve as a kind of passports he was to produce and post up one of them in each of the towns through which he had to pass and hoped he might thus succeed in dragging his prisoner without opposition all the way to rome the pope seemed to have taken every precaution the electoral court knew not well what course to take violence would have been resisted but the difficulty was to oppose the chief of christianity when speaking with so much mildness and apparently with so much reason would it not be the best plan it was said to place luther somewhere in concealment until the storm was over an unexpected event relieved luther the elector and the reformation from this difficult situation the aspect of affairs suddenly changed on the twelfth of january fifteen hundred and nineteen maximilian the emperor of germany died and frederick of saxony agreeably to the germanic constitution became regent of the empire from this time the elector feared not the schemes of nuncios while new interests began to engross the court of rome interest which obliging her to be chary of giving offence to frederick arrested the blow which miltitz and de vio were undoubtedly meditating the pope earnestly desired to prevent charles of austria already king of naples from ascending the imperial throne a neighbouring king appeared to him more formidable than a german monk and in his anxiety to secure the elector who might be of essential service to him in the matter he resolved to give some respite to the monk that he might be the better able to oppose the king both however advanced in spite of him in addition to the change thus produced in leo there was another circumstance which tended to avert the storm impending over the reformation the death of the emperor was immediately followed by political commotions in the south of the empire the swabian confederation sought to punish ulrich of wurtemberg for his infidelity to it while in the south the bishop of hildesheim proceeded sword in hand to invade the bishopric of minden and the territories of the duke of brunswick how could men in power amid such disturbances attach any importance to a dispute relating to the remission of sins but above all the reputation for wisdom enjoyed by the elector now regent of the empire and the protection which he gave to the new teachers were made subservient by providence to the progress of the reformation the tempest says luther intermitted its fury and papal excommunication began to fall into contempt 
the gospel under the shade of the elector's regency spread far and wide and in this way great damage was sustained by the papacy moreover the severest prohibitions were naturally mitigated during an interregnum in everything there was more freedom and greater facility of action liberty which began to shed its rays on the infant reformation rapidly developed the still tender plant and any one might have been able to predict how favourable political freedom would prove to the progress of evangelical christianity miltitz having arrived in saxony before the death of maximilian lost no time in visiting his old friend spalatin but no sooner did he begin his complaint against luther than the chaplain made an attack upon tetzel acquainting the nuncio with the lies and blasphemies of the vendor of indulgences and assuring him that all germany blamed the dominican for the division which was rending the church miltitz was taken by surprise instead of accuser he had become the accused turning all his wrath upon tetzel he summoned him to appear at altenburg and give an account of his conduct the dominican as great a coward as a bully and afraid of the people whom he had provoked by his impostures had ceased his peregrinations over town and country and was living in retirement in the college of st paul he grew pale on receiving the letter of miltitz even rome is abandoning threatening and condemning him is insisting on dragging him from the only asylum in which he feels himself in safety and exposing him to the fury of his enemies tetzel refused to obey the nuncio's summons assuredly wrote he to miltitz on the thirty first of december fifteen hundred and eighteen i would not regard the fatigues of the journey if i could leave leipzig without endangering my life but the augustine martin luther has so stirred up men in power and incensed them against me that i am not in safety anywhere a great number of luther's partisans have conspired my death and therefore i cannot possibly come to you there was a striking contrast between the two men the one of whom was then living in the college of st paul at leipzig and the other in the cloister of the augustines at wittemberg in the presence of danger the servant of god displayed intrepid courage the servant of men despicable cowardice miltitz had orders in the first instance to employ the arms of persuasion and it was only in the event of failure that he was to produce his seventy briefs and at the same time endeavour by all the favours of rome to induce the elector to put down luther he accordingly expressed a desire to have an interview with the reformer their common friend spalatin offered his house for this purpose and luther left wittemberg on the second or third of january to repair to altenburg at this interview miltitz exhausted all the address of a diplomatist and a roman courtier the moment luther arrived the nuncio approached him with great demonstrations of friendship oh thought luther how completely his violence is turned into gentleness this new saul came into germany provided with more than seventy apostolic briefs to carry me alive and in chains to murderous rome but the lord has cast him down on the way dear martin said the pope's chamberlain to him in a coaxing tone i thought you were an old theologian sitting quietly behind your stove and stuffed with theological crotchets but i see that you are still young and in the full vigour of life do you know continued he in a more serious tone that you have stirred up the whole world against the pope and attached it to yourself miltitz was aware that to flatter men's pride is the most effectual mode of seducing them but he knew not the man with whom he had to do had i an army of twenty-five thousand men added he assuredly i would not undertake to seize you and carry you off to rome rome notwithstanding of her power felt herself feeble in the presence of a poor monk and the monk felt strong in the presence of rome god said luther arrests the billows of the ocean at the shore and arrests them by the sand the nuncio thinking he had thus prepared the mind of his opponent continued as follows 
do you yourself bind up the wound which you have inflicted on the church and which you alone can cure beware added he letting a few tears fall beware of raising a tempest which would bring ruin on christendom he then began gradually to insinuate that a recantation was the only remedy for the evil but he at the same time softened the offensiveness of the term by giving luther to understand that he had the highest esteem for him and by expressing his indignation at tetzel the net was laid by a skilful hand and how was it possible to avoid being taken in it had the archbishop of mentz spoken thus to me at the outset said the reformer afterwards this affair would not have made so much noise luther then replied with calmness but also with dignity and force he stated the just grievances of the church expressed all the indignation he felt at the archbishop of mentz and nobly complained of the unworthy treatment he had received from rome notwithstanding of the purity of his intentions miltitz though he had not expected this firm language was able however to conceal his wrath luther resumed i offer to be silent in future as to these matters and let the affair die out of itself provided my opponents are also silent but if they continue to attack me a petty quarrel will soon beget a serious combat my armour is quite ready i will do still more added he after a momentary pause i will write to his holiness acknowledging that i have been somewhat too violent and declaring that it was as a faithful child of the church i combated harangues which subjected her to mockery and insult from the people i even consent to publish a document in which i will request all who read my books not to see anything in them averse to the roman church but to remain subject to her yes i am disposed to do everything and bear everything but as to retraction never expect it from me luther's decided tone convinced miltitz that the wisest course was to appear satisfied with the promise which the reformer had just made and he merely proposed that an archbishop should be appointed arbiter to decide certain points which might come under discussion be it so said luther but i am much afraid that the pope will not consent to have a judge in that case no more will i accept the judgment of the pope and then the strife will begin anew the pope will give out the text and i will make the commentary thus terminated the first interview between luther and miltitz they had a second in which the truce or rather peace was signed luther immediately informed the elector of what had passed most serene prince and very gracious lord wrote he i hasten very humbly to inform your electoral highness that charles de miltitz and i have at length agreed and have terminated the affair by means of the two following articles first both parties are forbidden to preach or write or to do anything further in reference to the dispute which has arisen secondly miltitz will immediately acquaint the holy father with the state of matters his holiness will order an enlightened bishop to inquire into the affair and specify the erroneous articles which i am required to retract if i am found to be in error i will retract willingly and never more do anything that may be prejudicial to the honour or authority of the holy roman church the agreement being thus made miltitz appeared quite delighted for a hundred years exclaimed he no affair has given the cardinals and roman courtiers more anxiety than this they would have given ten thousand ducats sooner than consent to its longer continuance the chamberlain of the pope made a great show of feeling before the monk of wittemberg sometimes he expressed joy at other times shed tears this display of sensibility made little impression on the reformer but he refrained from showing what he thought of it i looked as if i did not understand what we meant by these crocodile tears said he the crocodile is said to weep when it cannot seize its prey luther having accepted an invitation to supper from miltitz the host laid aside the stiffness attributed to his office while luther gave full scope to his natural gaiety 
it was a joyous repast and when the parting hour arrived the legate took the heretical doctor in his arms and kissed him a judas kiss thought luther i pretended wrote he to staupitz not to comprehend all these italian manners was this then to be in truth the kiss of reconciliation between rome and the dawning reformation miltitz hoped so and rejoiced at it for he had a nearer view than the courtiers of rome of the fearful results which the reformation might produce in regard to the papacy if luther and his opponents are silent said he to himself the dispute will be ended and rome by availing herself of favourable circumstances will regain all her ancient influence it thus seemed that the debate was drawing to a close rome had stretched out her arms and luther had apparently thrown himself into them but the reformation was the work not of man but of god the error of rome consisted in seeing the quarrel of a monk where she ought to have seen an awakening of the church the revival of christendom was not to be arrested by the kisses of a pope's chamberlain miltitz in fulfilment of the agreement which he had just concluded proceeded from altenburg to leipzig where tetzel was residing there was no occasion to shut tetzel's mouth for sooner than speak he would if it had been possible have hidden himself in the bowels of the earth but the nuncio was determined to discharge his wrath upon him immediately on his arrival at leipzig miltitz summoned the unhappy tetzel before him loaded him with reproaches accused him of being the author of the whole mischief and threatened him with the pope's displeasure nor was this all the agent of the house of fuge who was then at leipzig was confronted with him miltitz laid before the dominican the accounts of that house together with papers which he himself had signed and proved that he had squandered or stolen considerable sums the poor wretch who had stickled at nothing in his day of glory was overwhelmed by the justice of these accusations despair seized him his health gave way and he knew not where to hide his shame luther heard of the miserable condition of his old enemy and was the only person who felt for him in a letter to spalatin he says i pity tetzel nor did he confine himself to such expressions he hated not the man but his misconduct and at the moment when rome was pouring out her wrath upon him wrote to him in the most consolatory terms but all was to no purpose tetzel stung by remorse alarmed at the reproaches of his best friends and dreading the anger of the pope not long after died miserably and as was supposed of a broken heart luther in fulfilment of his promises to miltitz on the third of march wrote the following letter to the pope blessed father will your blessedness deign to turn your paternal ears which are like those of christ himself towards your poor sheep and kindly listen to its bleat what shall i do most holy father i am unable to bear the fierceness of your anger and know not how to escape from it i am asked to retract and would hasten to do so could it lead to the end which is proposed by it but owing to the persecutions of my enemies my writings have been circulated far and wide and are too deeply engraven on men's hearts to be effaced a recantation would only add to the dishonour of the church of rome and raise an universal cry of accusation against her most holy father i declare before god and all his creatures that i had never wished and do not now wish either by force or guile to attack the authority of the roman church or of your holiness i acknowledge that there is nothing in heaven or on the earth which ought to be put above this church unless it be jesus christ the lord of all these words might seem strange and even reprehensible in the mouth of luther did we not reflect that the light did not break in upon him all at once but by slow and progressive steps they show and this is very important that the reformation was not simply an opposition to the papacy its accomplishment was not effected by warring against this or that form or by means of this or that negative tendency 
opposition to the pope was only one of its secondary features its creating principle was a new life a positive doctrine jesus christ the lord of all and paramount to all to rome herself as luther says in the conclusion of his letter to this principle the revolution of the sixteenth century is truly to be ascribed it is probable that at an earlier period a letter from the monk of wittemberg positively refusing to retract would not have been allowed by the pope to pass without animadversion but maximilian was dead the topic of engrossing interest was the election of his successor and amid the political intrigues which then agitated the pontifical city luther's letter was overlooked the reformer was employing his time to better purpose than his powerful antagonist while leo x engrossed by his interests as a temporal prince was straining every nerve to prevent a dreaded neighbour from reaching the imperial throne luther was daily growing in knowledge and in faith he studied the decretals of the popes and made discoveries which greatly modified his views writing to spalatin he says i am reading the decretals of the popes and let me say it in your ear i know not whether the pope is antichrist himself or only his apostle to such a degree in these decretals is christ outraged and crucified still he continued to respect the ancient church of rome and had no thought of separating from her let the roman church said he in the explanation which he had promised miltitz to publish be honoured of god above all others on this point there cannot be a doubt st peter st paul forty-six popes and several hundred thousand martyrs have shed their blood in her bosom and there vanquished hell and the world so that the eye of god specially rests upon her although everything about her is now in a very sad condition that is no ground for separating from her on the contrary the worse things are the more firmly we should cling to her our separation is not the means by which she can be improved we must not abandon god because there is a devil nor the children of god who are still at rome because the majority are wicked no sin no wickedness can justify us in destroying charity or violating unity for charity can do all things and nothing is difficult to unity it was not luther that separated from rome but rome that separated from luther and by so doing rejected the ancient catholic faith of which he was then the representative nor was it luther that deprived rome of her power and compelled her bishop to descend from a usurped throne the doctrines which he announced the doctrine of the apostles again divinely proclaimed throughout the church with great force and admirable purity alone could prevail against a power by which the church had for ages been enslaved these declarations which luther published at the end of february did not fully satisfy miltitz and de vio these two vultures after both missing their prey had retired within the ancient walls of treves there seconded by the prince archbishop they hoped jointly to accomplish the object in which they had failed individually the two nuncios were aware that nothing more was to be expected from frederick now invested with supreme power in the empire they saw that luther persisted in his refusal of retraction the only plan therefore was to withdraw the heretical monk from the protection of the elector and entice him into their own neighbourhood if the reformer were once in treves in a state subject to a prince of the church he would be dexterous indeed if he got away without giving full satisfaction to the sovereign pontiff the scheme was immediately proceeded with luther said miltitz to the elector archbishop of treves has accepted your grace as arbiter call him therefore before you the elector of treves accordingly third of may wrote to the elector of saxony and requested him to send luther de vio and afterwards miltitz himself also wrote announcing that the rose of gold had arrived at augsburg at the house of fuge now thought they is the moment to strike the decisive blow but things were changed and neither frederick nor luther felt alarmed 
the elector understanding his new position had no longer any fear of the pope and far less of his servants the reformer seeing miltitz and de vio in concert had some idea of the fate which awaited him if he complied with their invitation everywhere says he on all hands and in all ways they seek my life besides he had requested the pope to decide but the pope engrossed with crowns and intrigues had given no answer luther thus wrote to miltitz how could i undertake the journey without an order from rome amid the troubles which shake the empire how could i face so many dangers and subject myself to so much expense i who am the poorest of men the elector of treves a man of wisdom and moderation and a friend of frederick was willing to meet his views he had no desire moreover to involve himself in the affair without being positively called upon he therefore agreed with the elector of saxony to defer the investigation till the next diet two years elapsed before this diet assembled at worms while the hand of providence successfully warded off all the dangers which threatened him luther was boldly advancing to a result of which he was not himself aware his reputation was extending the cause of truth was gaining strength and the number of the students of wittemberg among whom were the most distinguished young men in germany rapidly increased our town wrote luther can scarcely contain all who come to it and on another occasion the number of students increases out of measure like a stream overflowing its banks but germany was no longer the only country in which the voice of the reformer was heard it had passed the frontiers of the empire and begun to shake the foundations of the roman power in the different states of christendom frobenius the famous printer of Baale, had published the collected works of luther which were rapidly disposed of at Baal even the bishop applauded luther and the cardinal of sion after reading his work exclaimed somewhat ironically and punning on his name o luther thou art a true luther a true purifier lauterer erasmus was at louvain when luther's works arrived in the netherlands the prior of the augustins of antwerp who had studied at wittemberg and according to the testimony of erasmus held true primitive christianity and many other belgians besides read them with avidity but says the scholar of rotterdam those who sought only their own interest and entertained the people with old wives fables gave full vent to their grovelling fanaticism it is not in my power says erasmus in a letter to luther to describe the emotions the truly tragic scenes which your writings have produced frobenius sent six hundred copies of the works into france and spain they were publicly sold at paris and as far as appears the doctors of sorbonne then read them with approbation it was time said several of them that those engaged in the study of the holy scriptures should speak thus freely in england the works were received with still greater eagerness spanish merchants at antwerp caused them to be translated into their native tongue and sent them into spain assuredly said pallavicini these merchants were of moorish blood calvi a learned bookseller of pavia carried a great number of copies of the works into italy and circulated them in all the transalpine towns this learned man was animated not by a love of gain but a desire to contribute to the revival of piety the vigour with which luther maintained the cause of godliness filled him with joy all the learned of italy exclaimed he will concur with me and we will see you celebrated in stanzas composed by our most distinguished poets frobenius in transmitting a copy of the publication to luther told him all these gladdening news and added i have disposed of all the copies except ten and never had so good a return other letters also informed luther of the joy produced by his works i am glad says he that the truth gives so much pleasure although she speaks with little learning and in a style so barbarous such was the commencement of the revival in the different countries of europe 
in all countries if we except switzerland and even france where the gospel had previously been heard the arrival of luther's writings forms the first page in the history of the reformation a printer of Baal diffused these first germs of the truth. At the moment when the Roman pontiff entertained hopes of suppressing the work in Germany, it began in France, the Netherlands, Italy, Spain, England, and Switzerland. And now, even should Rome hew down the original trunk, what would it avail? The seeds are already diffused over every soil. End of Book 5, Chapter 1Book 5, Chapter 2 of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean-Henri Mel d'Aubigné, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The war seems ended in Germany. Eck revives the contest. Debate between Eck and Karlstadt. The question of the Pope. Luther replies alarm of luther's friends luther's courage truth triumphs single-handed refusal of duke george delight of mosellanus and fears of erasmus while the combat was only beginning beyond the limits of the empire it seemed to him almost ceased within it the most blustering soldiers of rome the franciscan monks of jutterbock after having imprudently attacked luther had after a vigorous rejoinder from the reformer hastened to resume silence the partisans of the pope were quiet and tetzel was unfit for service luther's friends conjured him not to persist in the contest and he had promised to comply the theses were beginning to be forgotten by this perfidious peace the eloquent tongue of the reformer was completely paralysed and the reformation seemed to be arrested but says luther afterwards when speaking of this period men were imagining vain things for the lord had arisen to judge the nations god says he in another place does not lead but urges and hurries me along i am not my own master i would fain be at rest but am precipitated into the midst of tumult and revolution the person who renewed the contest was eck the schoolman luther's old friend and the author of the obelisks he was sincerely attached to the papacy but seems to have been devoid of genuine religious sentiment and to have belonged to a class of men at all times too numerous who value learning and even theology and religion merely as a means of gaining a name in the world vain glory lurks under the priest's cassock as well as under the soldier's helmet eck had studied the art of disputation according to the scholastic rules and was an acknowledged master in this species of warfare while the knights of the middle ages and the warriors at the period of the reformation sought glory in tournaments the schoolmen sought it in the syllogistic disputations which were often exhibited in universities eck who was full of himself stood high in his own opinion and was proud of his talents of the popularity of his cause and the trophies which he had won in eight universities in hungary lombardy and germany eagerly longed for an opportunity of displaying his power and dexterity in debate with the reformer he had spared nothing to secure the reputation of being one of the most celebrated scholars of the age he was ever seeking to stir up new discussions to produce a sensation and by means of his exploits procure access to all the enjoyments of life a tour which he made in italy had by his own account been only a series of triumphs the most learned of the learned had been constrained to subscribe to his theses a practised bravado he fixed his eyes on a new field of battle where he thought himself secure of victory that little monk who had grown up all at once into a giant that luther whom no one had hitherto been able to vanquish offended his pride and excited his jealousy it might be that eck in seeking his own glory might destroy rome 
but scholastic vanity was not to be arrested by any such consideration theologians as well as princes have repeatedly sacrificed the general interest to their individual glory let us attend to the circumstances which gave the doctor of ingolstadt an opportunity of entering the lists with his troublesome rival the zealous but too ardent karlstadt was still of one mind with luther the special bond of union between them being their attachment to the doctrine of grace and their admiration of st augustine karlstadt who was of an enthusiastic temperament and possessed little prudence was not a man to be arrested by the address and policy of a miltitz in opposition to the obelisks of dr eck he had published theses in which he defended luther and their common faith eck had replied and karlstadt determined not to leave him the last word had rejoined the combat grew warm eck eager to avail himself of so favourable an opportunity had thrown down the gauntlet and the impetuous karlstadt had taken it up god employed the passions of these two men to accomplish his designs though luther had taken no part in these debates he was destined to be the hero of the fight there are men whom the force of circumstances always brings upon the scene leipzig was fixed upon and hence the origin of the celebrated discussion which bears its name eck cared little about combating with karlstadt and even vanquishing him luther was the opponent whom he had in view he accordingly employed every means to bring him into the field and with this view published thirteen theses directed against the leading doctrines which had been espoused by the reformer the thirteenth was in these terms we deny that the roman church was not superior to other churches before the time of pope sylvester and we acknowledge at all times that he who has occupied the see of st peter and professed his faith is the successor of st peter and the vicar of jesus christ sylvester lived in the time of constantine the great and hence eck in this thesis denied that the primacy which rome enjoyed was conferred on her by that emperor luther whose consent to remain silent had not been given without reluctance was strongly excited when he read these propositions he saw that he was the person aimed at and felt that he could not without honour evade the contest this man says he names karlstadt as his antagonist and at the same time makes his assault upon me but god reigns and knows what result he designs to bring out of this tragedy the question is not between dr eck and me god's purpose will be accomplished thanks to eck this affair which hitherto had been mere sport will at length become serious and give a fatal blow to the tyranny of rome and the roman pontiff rome herself broke the agreement she did more when she renewed the signal for battle she directed it to a point which luther had not previously attacked the subject which dr eck singled out for his antagonists was the primacy of the pope in thus following the dangerous example which tetzel had given rome invited the blows of the champion and if she left her mangled members on the arena she had herself to blame for the punishment inflicted by his mighty arm the pontifical supremacy being once overthrown the whole of the roman platform fell to pieces hence the papacy was in imminent peril and yet neither miltitz nor cajetan took any steps to prevent this new contest did they imagine that the reformation would be vanquished or were they smitten with that blindness by which the ruin of the mighty is accomplished luther who by his long silence had given an example of rare moderation boldly met the challenge of his antagonist whose theses he immediately opposed by counter theses the last was in these terms the primacy of the church of rome is defended by means of miserable decretals of the roman pontiffs composed within the last four hundred years 
whereas this primacy is contradicted by the authentic history of eleven centuries the declarations of holy scripture and the canons of the council of nice which is the purest of all canons at the same time luther thus wrote to the elector god knows it was my firm determination to be silent and i rejoiced to see the game at length brought to a close so faithfully have i observed the paction concluded with the pope's commissioner that i did not reply to sylvester prierius notwithstanding of the taunts of adversaries and the counsels of friends but now dr eck attacks me and not only me but the whole university of wittemberg besides i cannot allow it to be thus covered with obloquy at the same time luther wrote to karlstadt i am unwilling excellent andrew that you should engage in this quarrel since i am the person aimed at i will gladly lay aside my serious labours and enter into the sports of these flatterers of the roman pontiff then apostrophizing his adversary with disdain and calling from wittemberg to ingolstadt he exclaims now then my dear eck be courageous and gird thy sword upon thy thigh thou mighty man having failed to please you as mediator perhaps i will please you better as antagonist not that i have any thought of vanquishing you but after all the trophies which you have gained in hungary lombardy and bavaria at least if we are to take your account for it i will give you an opportunity of acquiring the name of the conqueror of saxony and misnia so that you will be for ever saluted by the glorious title of augustus all luther's friends did not share his courage for up to this hour none had been able to withstand the sophistry of dr eck but what alarmed them most was the subject of dispute the primacy of the pope how does the poor monk of wittemberg dare to encounter this giant who for ages has crushed all his enemies the courtiers of the elector begin to tremble spalatin the confidant of the prince and intimate friend of the reformer is full of anxiety frederick too feels uneasy even the sword of the knight of the holy sepulchre with which he had been armed at jerusalem would be unequal to this warfare luther alone feels no alarm his thought is the lord will deliver him into my hands the faith with which he is animated enables him to strengthen his friends i beg of you my dear spalatin said he not to give yourself up to fear you know well that if christ was not with me all that i have done up to this hour must have been my ruin was it not lately written from italy to the chancellor of the duke of pomerania that i had upset rome and that not knowing how to appease the tumult they were purposing to attack me not according to the forms of justice but by roman finesse the very words used that is i presume by poison ambush and assassination i restrain myself and from love to the elector and the university keep back many things which i would employ against babylon were i elsewhere oh my poor spalatin it is impossible to speak of scripture and of the church without irritating the beast never therefore hope to see me at rest at least until i renounce theology if this work is of god it will not be terminated before all my friends have forsaken me as christ was forsaken by his disciples truth will endure single-handed and triumph in virtue of its own prowess not mine or yours or any man's if i fall the world will not perish with me but wretch that i am i fear i am not worthy to die in such a cause rome he again wrote about this time rome is burning with eagerness to destroy me while i sit quiet and hold her in derision i am informed that in the field of flora at rome one martin luther has been publicly burned in effigy after being loaded with execrations i abide their fury the whole world continues he is in agitation heaving to and fro what will happen god knows for my part i foresee wars and disasters the lord have mercy on us
luther wrote letter after letter to duke george in whose states leipzig is entreating permission to repair thither and to take part in the debate but received no answer the grandson of the bohemian king podiebrad alarmed at luther's proposition concerning the pope and afraid of seeing saxony involved in the wars of which bohemia had so long been the theatre was unwilling to grant the doctor's request luther therefore determined to publish explanations of his thirteenth thesis but this treatise far from persuading duke george on the contrary confirmed him in his resolution positively refusing to give the reformer authority to debate he merely allowed him to be present as a spectator this was a great disappointment to luther nevertheless as he had only one wish and that was to obey god he resolved to attend as a spectator and await the result the prince at the same time did everything in his power to forward the discussion between eck and karlstadt duke george was devoted to the ancient doctrine but he was upright and sincere and friendly to free inquiry and did not think that an opinion was to be charged with heresy merely because it displeased the court of rome the elector moreover urged his cousin to permit the discussion and the duke confirmed by frederick's statements ordered it to take place bishop adolphus of merseburg in whose diocese leipzig is situated was more alive than miltitz and cajetan to the danger of trusting such important questions to the chances of single combat rome could not expose the fruit of the labours of so many ages to such hazard all the theologians of leipzig were equally alarmed and implored their bishop to prevent the discussion adolphus accordingly presented most energetic remonstrances to duke george who replied with much good sense i am surprised at seeing a bishop so terrified at the ancient and laudable custom of our fathers in examining doubtful questions as to matters of faith if your theologians refused to defend their doctrines the money given to them would be far better employed in the maintenance of aged women and young children who would be able at least to spin and sing this letter had little effect on the bishop and his theologians there is in error a secret consciousness which makes it dread inquiry even when making loud professions of being favourable to it after an imprudent advance it makes a cowardly retreat truth did not give the challenge but firmly stood its ground error gave it and ran off moreover the prosperity of the university of wittemberg excited the jealousy of that of leipzig the monks and priests inveighed from the pulpits of that city urging the people to shun the new heretics slandering luther and painting him as well as his friends in the blackest colours in order to stir up the fanaticism of the populace against the reformers tetzel who was still alive awoke to cry from the depths of his retreat it is the devil that is forcing on this contest all the professors of leipzig however did not participate in these apprehensions some belonged to the indifferent class consisting of persons who are always ready to laugh at the faults of both parties of this class was the greek professor peter mosellanus who cared very little for john eck karlstadt and martin luther but anticipated great amusement from the strife writing to his friend erasmus he says john eck who is the most illustrious of pen gladiators and rhapsodists and like the socrates of aristophanes contemns even the gods is to have a turn in debate with andrew karlstadt the battle will end in uproar and there will be laughter in it for ten democratuses the timid erasmus on the contrary was frightened at the idea of a combat and his prudence ever ready to take alarm would fain have prevented this discussion in a letter to melanchthon he says if you will be advised by erasmus you will be more anxious to promote the advancement of sound literature than to attack the enemies of it my belief is that in this way our progress will be greater above all while engaged in this struggle let us not forget that victory must be obtained not only by eloquence but also by moderation and meekness 
neither the alarms of priests nor the prudence of pacificators could now prevent the combat the parties made ready their weapons end of book five chapter two book five chapter three of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain book five chapter three arrival of eck and the wittembergers amsdorf the students karlstadt's accident placard eck and luther pleissenberg shall judges be appointed luther objects at the time when the electors met at frankfurt to give an emperor to germany june fifteen hundred and nineteen theologians met at leipzig for an act which though unnoticed by the world was destined to be not less important in its results eck was the first who arrived at the place of rendezvous on the twenty first of june he entered leipzig in company with polyander a young man whom he had brought from ingolstadt to report the debate all kinds of honours were paid to the scholastic doctor who on the fete dieu paraded the town in full canonicals and at the head of a numerous procession there was a general eagerness to see him according to his own account all the inhabitants were in his favour nevertheless adds he a rumour was current in the town that i was to be worsted in the encounter the day after the fete that is friday the twenty fourth of june st john's day the wittembergers arrived karlstadt ex destined opponent came first in a chariot by himself next in an open carriage came duke barnim of pomerania who was then studying at wittemberg under the direction of a tutor and had been elected rector of the university on each side of him sat the two great theologians the fathers of the reformation melancthon and luther melancthon had been unwilling to quit his friend he had said to spalatin martin the soldier of the lord has stirred up this fetid marsh i cannot think of the shameful conduct of the pope's theologians without indignation be firm and adhere to us luther himself had expressed a desire that his achates as he has been called should accompany him john langer vicar of the augustines some doctors in law several masters of arts two licentiates in theology and other ecclesiastics among whom nicholas amsdorf was conspicuous closed the rear amsdorf the member of a noble family in saxony disregarding the brilliant career which his birth might have opened to him had devoted himself to theology the theses on indulgences having brought him to the knowledge of the truth he had forthwith made a bold profession of the faith vigorous in intellect and vehement in temper amsdorf often pushed on luther by nature abundantly ardent to acts which were perhaps imprudent born to high rank he was not overawed by the great and occasionally addressed them with a freedom bordering on rudeness the gospel of jesus christ said he one day in an assembly of nobles belongs to the poor and afflicted and not to you princes lords and courtiers whose lives are passed in luxury and joy but we have not yet mentioned the whole train from wittemberg a large body of students accompanied their teachers eck affirms that the number amounted to two hundred armed with pikes and halberds they walked beside the carriages of the doctors ready to defend them and proud of their cause such was the order in which the body of reformers entered leipzig just as they passed the grimmer gate which is in front of st paul's cemetery one of the wheels of karlstadt's carriage broke down the archdeacon who with great self-complacency was enjoying the solemn entry tumbled into the mire he was not hurt but was obliged to proceed to his lodgings on foot luther's chariot which was immediately behind karlstadt's moved rapidly forward and delivered the reformer safe and sound 
the inhabitants of leipzig who had assembled to witness the entry of the wittemberg champions considered the accident as a bad omen for karlstadt and the inference was soon current over the town that is that he would be defeated in the combat but that luther would come off victorious adolphus of merseberg did not remain idle as soon as he learned the approach of luther and karlstadt and even before they had lighted from their carriages he caused a notice to be posted up on all the church doors forbidding the discussion under pain of excommunication duke george astonished at his presumption ordered the town council to tear down the bishop's placard and imprison the individual which had been employed to put it up the duke george who had come in person to leipzig attended by all his court among others by jerome emser with whom luther spent the famous evening at dresden sent the disputants the usual presents the duke boasted eck presented me with a fine stag and gave karlstadt only a roebuck eck was no sooner informed of luther's arrival than he called upon him what said he it is said that you refuse to debate with me luther how can i when the duke forbids me eck if i cannot debate with you i am not anxious to have anything to do with karlstadt it was for you i came here then after a short pause he added if i obtain the duke's permission will you take the field luther joyfully obtain it and we shall debate eck forthwith repaired to the duke and tried to dissipate his fears representing to him that he was certain of victory and that the authority of the pope so far from suffering by the discussion would come out of it more glorious we must strike at the head if luther stands erect so do all his adherents if he falls they all fall george granted permission the duke had caused a large hall to be prepared in his palace of pleissenburg two desks had been erected opposite to each other tables arranged for the notaries who were to take down the discussion in writing and benches for the spectators the desks and benches were covered with rich tapestry at the doctor of wittemberg's desk was suspended the portrait of st martin after whom he was named and at that of dr eck the portrait of the knight of st george we shall see said the arrogant eck with his eye on the emblem whether i do not with my steed trample down my enemies everything bespoke the importance which was attached to the combat on twenty fifth of june the parties met in the castle to arrange the order of proceeding eck who had more confidence in his declamation and gesture than in his arguments exclaimed we will debate freely off-hand and the notaries will not take down our words in writing karlstadt the agreement was that the discussion should be written down published and submitted to the judgment of all men eck to write down everything is to wear out the spirit of the disputants and protract the battle in that case there can be no hope of the vivacity requisite in an animated debate do not lay an arrest on the flow of eloquence dr eck's friends supported his proposal but karlstadt persisted in his objection and eck was obliged to yield eck be it so let there be writing but at all events the debate when taken down by the notaries is not to be published before it has been submitted to the decision of judges luther the truth of dr eck and the eckians fears the light eck there must be judges luther and what judges eck after the debate is over we will agree upon them the objection of the partisans of rome was evident if the theologians of wittemberg accepted judges their cause was lost it was obvious beforehand who the persons were whom their opponents would suggest and yet the reformers if they refused them would be covered with obloquy as it would be circulated everywhere that they were afraid of submitting to impartial judges the judges whom the reformers desired were not individuals whose opinion was already declared but the whole of christendom their appeal was made to the general voice 
it mattered little who condemned them if in pleading their cause in presence of the christian world they succeeded in bringing some individuals to the light luther says a roman historian demanded all the faithful for judges in other words demanded a tribunal so numerous that there could be no urn large enough to hold its votes the meeting broke up see their stratagem said luther and his friends to each other they would to a certainty ask to have the pope or the universities for judges in fact the theologians of rome next morning sent one of their party to luther with a proposal that the judge should be the pope the pope said luther how could i accept him beware exclaimed all his friends of accepting conditions so unjust eck and his friends having consulted anew gave up the pope and proposed certain universities don't take from us the liberty which you have already granted us replied luther we cannot yield this point resumed eck then exclaimed luther i don't debate they again parted and what had just passed was talked of over the whole town the romans kept crying everywhere luther won't debate he refuses to accept of any judge commenting on and torturing his words they endeavoured to represent them in the most unfavourable light what truly will he not debate say the best friends of the reformer and hasten to him to express their alarm you decline the contest exclaim they your refusal will bring eternal disgrace on your university and your cause this was to attack luther in his most tender point very well replied he his heart filled with indignation i accept the terms which are imposed on me but i reserve a right of appeal and i decline the court of rome end of book five chapter three Book Five, Chapter Four of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume Two, by Jean Henri Mail d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. The twenty seventh of June was the day fixed for the commencement of the discussion. In the morning, the parties met in the hall of the university and thereafter walked in procession to the church of st thomas where high mass was celebrated by the order and at the expense of the duke after service those present proceeded to the ducal castle at their head walked duke george and the duke of pomerania next came counts abbots knights and other persons of distinction and lastly the doctors of the two parties a guard composed of seventy-six citizens carrying halberds accompanied the procession with colours flying and drums beating and halted at the castle gate on the arrival at the palace each took his place in the hall where the debate was to take place duke george the hereditary prince john prince george of anhalt a boy of twelve and the duke of pomerania occupying the seats allotted to them Mosellanus, by order of the duke mounted a pulpit to remind the theologians of the manner in which the discussion was to be carried on if you begin to quarrel said the orator to them what difference will there be between a theological disputant and a swaggering duelist what is victory here but just to recall a brother from his error each it would seem should be more desirous to be conquered than to conquer at the conclusion of the address sacred music echoed along the aisles of the pleissenberg the whole assembly knelt down and the ancient hymn of invocation to the holy spirit veni sancte spiritus was sung solemn hour in the annals of the reformation the invocation was thrice repeated and while the solemn chant was pealing the defenders of the ancient and the champions of the new doctrines the men of the church of the middle ages and those desirous of re-establishing the church of the apostles mingling together without distinction in lowly attitude bent their faces to the ground the ancient tie of one single communion still united all these different minds 
and the same prayer still proceeded from all these lips as if a single heart had dictated it these were the last moments of external lifeless unity for which a new spiritual living unity was about to be substituted the holy spirit was invoked in behalf of the church and the holy spirit was about to answer by a revival of christendom when the hymn and prayer were finished the assembly rose up the discussion should have now commenced but as the hour of noon had arrived there was an adjournment of two hours the leading personages who proposed to attend the debate having dined with the duke returned with him after dinner to the castle hall which was filled with spectators meetings of this description were the public assemblies in which the representatives of the age discussed questions of general and engrossing interest the orators were soon at their post that a better idea may be formed of them we will give their portraits as drawn by one of the most impartial witnesses of the debate martin luther is of middle size and so emaciated by hard study that one might almost count his bones he is in the vigour of life and his voice is clear and sonorous his learning and knowledge of the holy scriptures are beyond compare he has the whole word of god at command in addition to this he has a great store of arguments and ideas it were perhaps to be wished that he had a little more judgment in arranging his materials in conversation he is candid and courteous there is nothing stoical or haughty about him he has the art of accommodating himself to every individual his address is pleasing and replete with good humour he displays firmness and is never discomposed by the menaces of his adversaries be they what they may one is in a manner compelled to believe that in the great things which he has done god must have assisted him he is blamed however for being more sarcastic in his rejoinders than becomes a theologian especially when he announces new religious ideas karlstadt is of smaller stature his complexion is dark and sallow his voice disagreeable his memory less retentive and his temper more easily ruffled than luther's still however he possesses though in an inferior degree the same qualities which distinguish his friend eck is tall and broad-shouldered he has a strong and truly german voice and such excellent lungs that he would be well heard on the stage or would make an admirable town crier his accent is rather coarse than elegant and he has none of the gracefulness so much lauded by cicero and quintilian his mouth his eyes and his whole features suggest the idea of a soldier or a butcher rather than a theologian his memory is excellent and were his intellect equal to it he would be faultless but he is slow of comprehension and wants judgment without which all other gifts are useless hence when he debates he piles up without selection or discernment passages from the bible quotations from the fathers and arguments of all descriptions his assurance moreover is unbounded when he finds himself in difficulty he darts off from the matter in hand and pounces upon another sometimes even he adopts the view of his antagonist and changing the form of expression most dexterously charges him with the very absurdity which he himself was defending such according to mosellanus were the men who drew the eyes of the crowds who were then thronging into the great hall of pleissenburg the discussion was opened by eck and karlstadt eck for some moments fixed his eyes on the books which lay on the little table in front of his opponent's desk and seemed to give him uneasiness they were the bible and the fathers i decline the discussion exclaimed he suddenly if you are allowed to bring books with you a theologian have recourse to his books in discussion the astonishment of dr eck was still more astonishing it is merely a fig leaf which this adam is employing to hide his shame said luther did augustine consult no books in combating the manichees no matter ex-partisans made a great noise 
Karlstadt remonstrated. "'The man is altogether devoid of memory,' said Eck. At last it was decided, agreeably to the desire of the Chancellor of Ingolstadt, that each disputant should have the use only of his memory and his tongue. Thus, then, said several, the object in this debate will not be to discover truth, but to show off the eloquence and memory of the disputants. The discussion lasted seventeen days, but, as it is impossible to give the whole of it, we must, as a historian says, imitate painters who, in representing a battle, place the most distinguished exploits in front and leave the others in the background. The subject of discussion between Eck and Karlstadt was important. Before conversion, says Karlstadt, the will of man is incapable of doing good. Every good work comes entirely and exclusively from God, who gives first the will to do, and afterwards the ability to perform. This truth is proclaimed by the scriptures, which say, It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, and by Augustine, who, in disputing with the Pelagians, delivers it in almost the very same terms. Every work in which there is neither love to God nor obedience to his will is, in his sight, devoid of the only quality which could render it truly good, even should it be in other respects dictated by the most honourable human motives. Now there is in man a natural enmity to God, an enmity which he is utterly unable to suppress. He has not the power to do so. He even wants the will. If ever, therefore, it is to be suppressed, it must be by the power of God. This is the doctrine of free will, so much declaimed against in the world, and yet so simple. It had been the doctrine of the church, but the schoolmen had explained it in a manner which caused it to be misunderstood. No doubt, said they, the natural will of man cannot do anything which is truly pleasing to God, but it can do much to render man more capable and more worthy of receiving divine grace. These preparatives they termed merit of congruity. Because, as St. Thomas expressed it, it is congruous for God to bestow peculiar favour on those who make a good use of their will. In regard, again, to the conversion which man must undergo, it is no doubt true that, according to the schoolmen, the grace of God behoved to accomplish it, but still without excluding his natural powers. These powers, said they, have not been annihilated by sin. Sin only puts an obstacle in the way of their development, but as soon as this obstacle is removed, and this, according to them, was what the grace of God had to do, these powers begin again to act. To use one of their favourite comparisons, the bird whose legs are tied does not thereby lose either its powers or forget the art of flying, though it must be loosed by some other hand before it can be able again to use its wings. The same, said they, is the case with man. Such was the question discussed between Eck and Karlstadt. At first Eck seemed to deny Karlstadt's propositions out and out, but feeling the difficulty of maintaining his ground, said, I grant that the will has not power to do a good work, but receives it from God. Confess, then, rejoined Karlstadt, overjoyed at obtaining such a concession, that every good work comes entirely from God. Every good work comes indeed from God, replied the schoolman subtly, but not entirely. There, exclaimed Melanchthon, goes a discovery well worthy of theological science. An apple, added Eck, is all produced by the sun, but not altogether and without the cooperation of the tree. Assuredly no man ever thought of maintaining that an apple is all produced by the sun. Very well, said his opponents, going still deeper into this delicate question, so important in philosophy and in religion, let us consider how God acts on man and how man conducts himself when so acted on. I acknowledge, said Eck, that in conversion the first impulse comes from God, and that the human will is entirely passive. So far the disputants were agreed. 
i acknowledge said karlstadt on his part that after this first action on the part of god something must come from man something which st paul calls the will and which the fathers designate by consent here again both parties were agreed but at this point the separation began this consent of man said eck comes partly from our natural will and partly from the grace of god no said karlstadt this will in man is entirely created by god hereupon eck began to express astonishment and indignation at words so well fitted to impress a man with a sense of his utter nothingness your doctrine exclaims he makes man a stone or a block incapable of any counter action what replied the reformers does not the faculty of receiving the powers which god produces in him a faculty which we admit that he possesses sufficiently distinguish him from a stone and a block but resumed their antagonist by denying man all natural power you contradict experience we deny not was the reply that man possesses certain powers and has in him a faculty of reflecting meditating and choosing we only consider these powers and faculties as mere instruments incapable of doing anything that is good until the hand of god sets them in motion they are like the saw in the hands of the sawyer the great question of liberty was here debated and it was easy to demonstrate that the doctrine of the reformers did not divest man of the liberty of a moral agent or make him a passive machine the liberty of a moral agent consists in the power of acting conformably to his choice every action done without external constraint and in consequence of the determination of the mind itself is a free action the mind is determined by motives but we constantly see that the same motives act differently on different minds many do not act conformably to the motives which their judgment approves this inefficiency of motives is attributable to the obstacles which they meet with in the corruption of the understanding and the heart now god by giving a new heart and a new spirit removes these obstacles and thereby so far from depriving man of freedom on the contrary removes what prevented him from acting freely and in obedience to the dictates of his conscience in the language of the gospel it renders him free indeed john chapter eight verse thirty six a slight incident for a short time interrupted the debate karlstadt this is x account had prepared different heads of argument and as is done by many of the orators of our day read what he had written eck saw in this only a schoolboy's tactics and objected karlstadt embarrassed and fearing he might be taken at a disadvantage if deprived of his notebook insisted on retaining it ah said the scholastic doctor quite proud of the advantage which he thought he had over him his memory is shorter than mine the point having been submitted to arbiters it was decided that quotations from the fathers might be read but that in other respects the discussion should be extempore this first part of the discussion often met with interruption from the audience they roughed and screamed any proposition offensive to the ears of the majority instantly aroused their clamour and then as in our day it was necessary to call to order the disputants also occasionally allowed themselves to be carried away in the heat of discussion melancthon sat near luther and attracted almost equal attention he was of short stature and would scarcely have been thought more than eighteen luther who was a whole head taller seemed to be united to him by the closest friendship they came in went out and walked together to look at melancthon says a swiss theologian who studied at wittemberg one would think him a mere boy but in judgment learning and talent he is a giant it is difficult to comprehend how so much wisdom and genius can be contained within so puny a body between the sittings melancthon conferred with karlstadt and luther he assisted them in preparing for the debate and suggested arguments drawn from the stores of his vast erudition 
but during the discussion he remained quietly seated among the spectators giving close attention to everything that was said by the theologians occasionally however he came to the aid of karlstadt when the latter was on the point of giving way under the powerful declamation of the chancellor of ingolstadt the young professor whispered a word in his ear or slipped a paper to him on which he had noted down the answer Eck, on one occasion perceived this and indignant that this grammarian as he called him should presume to intermeddle with the discussion turned towards him and haughtily said be silent philip keep to your own studies and give me no disturbance perhaps eck had already a presentiment of the formidable adversary he was afterwards to encounter in this young man luther was offended at the rude insult given to his friend the judgment of philip said he weighs more with me than that of a thousand dr x the calm melancthon easily discerned the weak points of this discussion we can only be surprised says he with the wisdom and grace conspicuous in all his words when we think of the violence which was brought to the discussion of such subjects how could any advantage be derived from it the spirit of god loves retreat and silence there dwell those whose hearts he penetrates the bride of christ does not stand in streets and public places but conducts the bridegroom into her mother's house both parties claimed the victory eck employed all his address to make it appear that he had gained it as the points of divergence almost met he often exclaimed that he had brought over his opponent to his opinion or like a new proteus as luther calls him turning suddenly around he stated karlstadt's own opinion in different words and then asked with an air of triumph if he did not feel constrained to yield the unskilful who were unable to detect the sophist's manoeuvre applauded and triumphed with him in several respects the match was unequal karlstadt was slow and sometimes left his opponent's objections unanswered till next day eck on the contrary was master of his subject and could lay his hand at once on whatever he required he came forward with a haughty air mounted his desk with a firm step and when there stamped with his foot moved backwards and forwards made the ceiling ring with his powerful voice gave some sort of reply to every argument and astonished the audience with his memory and adroitness still eck without perceiving it conceded much more in the discussion than he had intended his partisans shouted and laughed at each of his turns but says luther i strongly suspect they only made a show of laughing and were exceedingly vexed at heart when they saw their chief who had commenced with so much bravado quit his standard abandon his army and become a shameless deserter three or four days after the discussion had commenced it was interrupted by the feast of st peter and st paul the duke of pomerania requested luther to preach before him on the occasion in his chapel luther gladly complied the chapel was soon filled and crowds still arriving it became necessary to remove to the great hall of the castle where the discussion was held luther preached from the text of the day on the grace of god and the power of peter and gave a popular exposition of the views which he was wont to maintain before a learned audience Christianity causes the light of truth to penetrate alike into the highest and the humblest intellects, and is in this way distinguished from all other religions and from all philosophical systems. The theologians of Leipzig, who had been present at the sermon, hastened to acquaint Eck with the expressions which had offended them. These subtle errors, exclaimed they, must be answered, must be publicly refuted. This was just what Eck wished all the churches were open to him and on four successive occasions he mounted the pulpit to declaim against luther and his sermon luther's friends were indignant and demanded that the theologian of wittemberg should be heard in his turn but they demanded in vain the pulpits were open to the enemies of evangelical truth but shut against those who proclaimed it 
i kept silence says luther and was obliged to submit to attacks insults and calumnies without being able to exculpate and defend myself the ecclesiastics were not the only persons who displayed hostility to the evangelical doctrine the citizens of leipzig were in this respect of one mind with their clergy and yielded themselves up with blind fanaticism to the falsehoods and animosities which were industriously propagated the principal inhabitants did not visit either luther or karlstadt they left them unnoticed when they met them in the street and tried to prejudice the duke against them on the other hand they visited and gave daily entertainments to the doctor of ingolstadt who enjoyed their good cheer and learnedly discussed the comparative merits of saxony and bavarian beer his manners somewhat free did not indicate a very strict morality the only thing offered to luther was the customary present of wine to the disputants moreover even those who wished him well were anxious that others should not know it several nicodemites visited him by night or in secret there were only two who did themselves honour by publicly declaring their friendship these were dr auerbach whom we have already met at augsburg and dr pistor junior the greatest excitement prevailed in the town the two parties formed as it were two hostile camps and sometimes came to blows in taverns frequent quarrels took place between the students of leipzig and wittemberg it was openly averred even at meetings of the clergy that luther carried about with him a devil confined in a little box whether the devil is in a box or only under his frock said eck maliciously i know not but most assuredly he is in one or other of them during the discussion several doctors of both parties lodged with the printer herbipolis and the dispute ran so high that the host was obliged to station a town officer at the top of the table with a halbert to keep the peace and prevent the guests from coming to blows one day baumgartner a vendor of indulgences had a scuffle with a gentleman a friend of luther and fell into such a rage that he dropped down dead froschel who gives the account says i was one of those who carried him to the grave the general agitation which prevailed was thus manifested then as now the discourses of the desk were re-echoed in the drawing-room and in the streets duke george though very decidedly in favour of eck did not betray so much passion as his subjects he invited eck luther and karlstadt to dine together with him he even asked luther to pay him a visit in private but soon showed how strongly he was prejudiced against him by your book on the lord's prayer said the duke to him with bitterness you have led many consciences astray there are persons who complain of not having been able to say one pater for more than four days end of book five chapter four chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five on the fourth of july the debate between eck and luther commenced everything announced that it would be keener more decisive and more interesting than that which had just been concluded and during which the audience had gradually thinned away the two antagonists descended into the arena resolved not to lay down their arms till victory should declare in favour of one of them all were in eager expectation for the subject to be debated was the primacy of the pope christianity has two great adversaries hierarchism and rationalism rationalism as applied to the doctrine of man's natural powers had been attacked by the reformation in the former branch of the leipzig discussion hierarchism viewed with reference to what is at once its apex and its base that is the doctrine of the pope was now to be considered on the one side appeared eck boasting of the debates in which he had been engaged as a general boasts of his battles 
on the other side stood luther to whom the conquest seemed to promise only persecution and obloquy but who came forward with a good conscience a firm resolution to sacrifice everything for the cause of truth and a confident expectation founded on faith in god and the deliverance which he affords new convictions had sunk deep into his mind as yet they were not arranged into a system but in the heat of debate they flashed forth like lightning grave and intrepid he manifested a decision which set all trammels at defiance his features bore marks of the storms which had raged within his soul and of the courage with which he was prepared to face new tempests two peasants sons representatives of the two systems which still divide christendom were on the eve of a contest the issue of which would go far to decide the future destiny of the state and the church at seven in the morning the two antagonists were in their desks in the midst of a numerous and attentive assembly luther rose and in the exercise of a necessary precaution modestly said in the name of the lord amen I declare that the respect which I feel for the sovereign pontiff would have disposed me to avoid this discussion had the excellent Dr. Eck left me any alternative. Eck, in thy name, dear Jesus, before I descend into the arena, I protest in your presence, mighty lords, that whatever I shall say is under correction of the first of all seas and the master who occupies it after a momentary pause eck continued there is in the church of god a primacy derived from jesus christ himself the church militant is an image of the church triumphant but the latter is a monarchical hierarchy rising step by step up to the sole head who is god and accordingly christ has established the same gradation upon earth what kind of monster should the church be if she were without a head luther turning towards the audience the doctor is correct in saying that the universal church must have a head if there is any one here who maintains the contrary let him stand up the remark does not at all apply to me Eck. if the church militant has never been without a monarch i should like to know who that monarch is if he is not the pontiff of rome luther the head of the church militant is not a man but jesus christ himself this i believe on the testimony of god christ says the scripture must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet we cannot therefore listen to those who would confine christ to the church triumphant in heaven his reign is a reign of faith we cannot see our head and yet we have him eck not admitting that he was beaten had recourse to other arguments and resumed according to saint cyprian sacerdotal unity is derived from rome luther granted in relation to the western church but is not the church of rome herself a descendant of the church of jerusalem which is properly the mother and nurse of all the churches Eck. st jerome declares that unless an extraordinary power superior to all other powers is given to the pope churches will have as many schisms as pontiffs luther granted that is to say this power might by human authority be attributed to the roman pontiff provided all the faithful consent to it and in like manner i for my part deny not that if all the faithful throughout the world were to concur in acknowledging the bishop either of rome or of paris or of magdeburg as prime and sovereign pontiff it would be necessary to acknowledge him as such in deference to this universal consent of the church the thing however never has been and never will be seen even in our own day does not the greek church refuse her assent to rome at this period luther was quite ready to acknowledge the pope as first magistrate of the church elected by her own free choice but he denied that he was of divine institution 
at a later period he denied that subjection was due to him in any respect and this denial he owed to the discussion at leipzig eck had come upon ground which he did not know so thoroughly as luther the latter it is true could not maintain his thesis that the papacy had not been in existence for more than four centuries eck quoted authorities of an earlier date and these luther was unable to obviate criticism not having yet attacked the spurious decretals but the nearer the discussion was brought to primitive times the more luther's strength increased eck appealed to the fathers luther quoted the fathers in reply and all the hearers were struck with his superiority to his rival that my exposition said he is that of st jerome i prove by st jerome's own epistle to evagrius in which he says every bishop whether at rome or eugubium or constantinople or regium or alexandria or tanis has the same merit and the same priesthood the power of riches and the humiliation of poverty constitute the only precedence or inferiority among bishops from the writings of the fathers luther passed to the decrees of councils which regard the bishop of rome as only a first among equals we read says he in the decree of the council of africa the bishop of the first see must not be called either prince of the pontiffs or sovereign pontiff or any other similar name but only bishop of the first see were the supremacy of the bishop of rome of divine institution would not these words be heretical eck replied by one of those subtle distinctions which were so familiar to him the bishop of rome if you will so have it is not universal bishop but bishop of the universal church luther i am quite willing to leave this reply unanswered let our hearers judge for themselves assuredly said he afterwards the gloss is worthy of a theologian and well fitted to satisfy a disputant thirsting for glory my expensive sojourn in leipzig has not been for nothing since i have learned that the pope though not indeed the universal bishop is the bishop of the universal church eck very well i come to the essential point the venerable doctor calls upon me to prove that the primacy of the church of rome is of divine institution i prove it by these words of christ thou art peter and on this rock i will build my church st augustine in one of his epistles has thus expounded the passage thou art peter and upon this rock that is to say on this peter i will build my church it is true augustine has elsewhere said that by this rock must be understood christ himself but he never retracted his former exposition luther if the reverend doctor would attack me he should first reconcile these contrary statements of augustine it is undeniable that saint augustine has again and again said that the rock was christ and he may perhaps have once said that it was peter himself but even should st augustine and all the fathers say that the apostle is the rock of which christ speaks i would combat their view on the authority of an apostle in other words divine authority for it is written no other foundation can any man lay than that is laid namely jesus christ peter himself calls christ the chief and cornerstone on which we are built up a spiritual house Eck. i am astonished at the humility and modesty with which the reverend doctor undertakes single-handed to combat so many distinguished fathers and to know better than sovereign pontiffs councils doctors and universities it would certainly be astonishing that god should have concealed the truth from so many saints and martyrs and not revealed it until the advent of the reverend father luther the fathers are not against me the distinguished doctors st augustine and st ambrose speak as i do super isto articulo fidei fundata est ecclesia says st ambrose when explaining what must be understood by the rock on which the church is built let my opponent then bridle his tongue 
to express himself as he does is to stir up strife not to discuss like a true doctor eck had not expected that his opponent would possess so much knowledge of the subject and be able to disentangle himself from the labyrinth in which he tried to bewilder him the reverend doctor said he has entered the lists after carefully studying his subject your highnesses will excuse me for not presenting them with such exact researches i came to debate and not to make a book eck was astonished but not beaten having no more arguments to give he had recourse to a mean and despicable artifice which if it did not vanquish his opponent would at least subject him to great embarrassment if the charge of being a bohemian a heretic a hussite fastens upon luther he is vanquished for the bohemians were detested in the church the scene of discussion was not far from the frontiers of bohemia saxony which immediately after the condemnation of john huss by the council of constance had been subjected to all the horrors of a long and ruinous war was proud of the resistance which she had then given to the hussites the university of leipzig had been founded to oppose their tenets and the discussion was in the presence of nobles princes and citizens whose fathers had fallen in that celebrated struggle to make out that luther was at one with huss was almost like giving him the finishing blow and this was the stratagem to which the doctor of ingolstadt had recourse from primitive times downwards says he it was acknowledged by all good christians that the church of rome holds its primacy of jesus christ himself and not of man i must confess however that the bohemians while obstinately defending their errors attacked this doctrine the venerable father must pardon me if i am an enemy of the bohemians because they are the enemies of the church and if the present discussion has reminded me of these heretics for according to my weak judgment the conclusions to which the doctor has come are all in favour of their errors it is even affirmed that the hussites loudly boast of this eck had calculated well all his partisans received the insinuation with acclamation and an expression of applause was general throughout the audience these slanders said the reformer at a later period tickled their fancy much more agreeably than the discussion itself luther i love not a schism and i never shall since the bohemians of their own authority separate from our unity they do wrong even were divine authority decisive in favour of their doctrine for at the head of all divine authority is charity and the unity of the spirit it was at the morning sitting on the fifth of july that luther thus expressed himself shortly after the meeting adjourned for dinner luther felt uneasy had he not gone too far in thus condemning the christians of bohemia have they not maintained the doctrine which luther is maintaining at this hour he sees all the difficulty of the step before him will he declare against the council which condemned john huss or will he abjure the grand idea of an universal christian church an idea deeply imprinted on his mind resolute luther hesitated not i must do my duty come what may accordingly when the assembly again met at two o'clock he rose and said firmly certain of the tenets of john huss and the bohemians are perfectly orthodox this much is certain for instance that there is only one universal church and again that it is not necessary to salvation to believe the roman church superior to others whether wycliffe or huss has said so i care not it is the truth this declaration of luther produced an immense sensation in the audience the abhorred names of huss and wycliffe pronounced with eulogium by a monk in the heart of a catholic assembly a general murmur was heard duke george himself felt as much alarmed as if he had actually seen the standard of civil war which had so long desolated the states of his maternal ancestors unfurled in saxony 
unable to conceal his emotion he struck his thigh shook his head and exclaimed loud enough to be heard by the whole assembly this man is mad the whole audience was extremely excited they rose to their feet and every one kept talking to his neighbour those who had fallen asleep awoke luther's opponents expressed their exultation while his friends were greatly embarrassed several persons who till then had listened to him with pleasure began to doubt his orthodoxy the impression produced upon the mind of the duke by this declaration was never effaced from this moment he looked upon the reformer with an unfavourable eye and became his enemy luther was not intimidated by this explosion of disapprobation one of his leading arguments was that the greeks had never recognized the pope and yet had never been declared heretics that the greek church had subsisted was subsisting and would subsist without the pope and was a church of christ as much as the church of rome Eck, on the contrary, boldly affirmed that the Christian Church and the Roman Church were one and the same, that the Greeks and Orientals, by abandoning the Church, had also abandoned Christian faith, and unquestionably were heretics. What, exclaimed Luther, are not Gregory of Nanzianzen, Basil the Great, Epiphanius, Chrysostom, and an immense number of other Greek bishops in bliss? And yet, they did not believe that the church of rome was superior to other churches it is not in the power of the pontiff of rome to make new articles of faith the christian believer has no other authority than the holy scriptures they alone constitute divine law i pray the illustrious doctor to admit that the pontiffs of rome were men and have the goodness not to make gods of them Eck had recourse to one of those witticisms which, at small cost, gave a little air of triumph to the person employing them. The reverend father, says he, not being well versed in the culinary art, makes an odd mixture of Greek saints and heretics, so that the perfume of holiness in the one disguises the poison in the other. Luther, hastily interrupting Eck, The worthy doctor is impertinent, I do not hold that there is any communion between Christ and Belial. Luther had taken a large step in advance. In 1516 and 1517 he had only attacked the discourses of the vendors of indulgences and had respected the decrees of the popes. At a later period he had rejected these decrees, but had appealed from them to a council. Now he had discarded this last authority also, declaring that no council can establish a new article of faith or claim to be infallible. Thus all human authorities had successively fallen before him. The sand brought along by the rain and the floods had disappeared, and now, for building up the ruins of the Lord's house, there remained only the eternal rock of the word of God venerable father said eck to him if you believe that a council lawfully assembled can err you are to me only a heathen man and a publican such were the discussions between the two doctors the audience were attentive but occasionally began to flag and hence were pleased with any incident which enlivened the scene and gave them a momentary relaxation the gravest matters have their comic interludes and so it was at leipzig duke george according to the custom of the time had a court fool to whom some wags said luther maintains that a court fool may marry eck maintains the contrary on this the fool took a great dislike to eck and every time he came into the hall with the servants of duke george eyed the theologian with a menacing air the chancellor of ingolstadt not disdaining to descend to pleasantry one day shut one eye the fool was blind of one and with the other began to squint at the poor creature who in a perfect rage let fly a volley of abuse the whole assembly says pfeiffer burst into laughter this amusing incident somewhat relieved their minds from the stretch on which they had been kept 
at the same time both in the town and in the churches scenes occurred which showed how much the partisans of rome were horrified at luther's bold assertions an outcry was raised against him especially in the convents attached to the pope luther had one day walked into the church of the dominicans before high mass the only persons present were some monks saying low mass at the side altars no sooner was it told in the cloister that the heretic luther was in the church than the monks came down in all haste laid hold of the ostensorium and carrying it into the tabernacle shut it up carefully watching it lest the holy sacrament should be profaned by the heretical eye of the augustine of wittemberg at the same time those who were saying mass hastily gathered up their articles quitted the altar ran across the church and took refuge in the sacristy just says a historian as if the devil had been at their heels the discussion became the general subject of conversation in the inns at the university and the court everyone gave his opinion duke george whatever his irritation may have been did not obstinately shut his ears against conviction one day when eck and luther were dining with him he interrupted their conversation saying let the pope be pope whether by divine or human law at all events he is pope luther was much pleased with the expression the prince says he never would have uttered it if my arguments had not made some impression on him the discussion on the primacy of the pope had lasted during five days on the eighth of july the doctrine of purgatory was discussed and occupied two days luther was still a believer in the existence of purgatory but he denied that the doctrine as held by the schoolmen and his opponent was taught either in scriptures or by the fathers our dr eck said he referring to the superficial knowledge of his opponent has to-day run over the holy scriptures almost without touching them just as an insect skims the water on the eleventh of july indulgences were discussed it was mere sport and burlesque says luther indulgences gave way at once and eck was almost entirely of my opinion eck himself said had i not disputed with dr martin on the primacy of the pope i could almost agree with him the discussion afterwards turned on repentance absolution by the priest and satisfactions eck as usual quoted the schoolmen the dominicans and the canons of the pope luther closed the discussion with these words the reverend doctor flees before the holy scriptures as the devil does before the cross for my part with all due deference to the fathers i prefer the authority of scripture and recommend it to our judges this closed the debate between eck and luther but karlstadt and the doctor of ingolstadt continued for two days longer to discuss the subject of human merit and good works on the sixteenth of july the whole proceeding after having lasted twenty days was closed by a discourse from the rector of leipzig the moment the discourse was finished thrilling music burst forth and the whole concluded with the te deum but during this solemn chant the feelings of the audience no longer were what they had been during the veni spiritus the presentiments which several persons had expressed seemed to be